gender roles in economics and politics, blah, 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 blah. So the same with race. Nevertheless, isn't it true that you still face a certain amount of substantive prejudice and bigotry in a larger society? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's the argument for single sex education and all black colleges. Better that you should go through both formative elements of testing your academic abilities, and for that matter, the whole run of student life, like organizations and leadership positions, without competition from males. Not, by the way, because the aim, of course, is that you're eventually going to go out into the world and compete with males, but won't you be better? Because you were given the opportunity. That's correct. Does that make sense? You were actually given the opportunity. And by the way, there, there's some statistical evidence that that works. That, that, now, understand, this is a, a generational thing. More, right, exactly. More women in more leadership positions went to all female colleges. But don't forget, leadership positions in this society generally come later in life. Mm -hmm. And that meant that many women in those positions went to college a, a generation ago when there were fewer opportunities for women in Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it will be interesting to see, and my guess is probably that will eventually mean that, that single-sex education will evaporate. But you understand one rational for it. Now the other thing is this, uh, and this is I think what was behind Gilman's attempt, cho 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 choice for a, a, a single-sex environment, to show that women are in fact capable of performing the entire range of social, economic, mechanical, intellectual functions. Do you see in other words? That's why she had to create a, a, a utopia, quote unquote. We'll get to the second question of whether it's really a utopia because there's another interesting plot question which I almost got to a couple of weeks ago, but I couldn't focus so I didn't get to it. Um, Don't say that, that. that. And that was this. Uh, um, uh, she, so do you understand? One of the things you know if you graduate from college is anything that's required of life uh, with respect to the performance of leadership functions, this, this is kind of, that's why I said earlier that these two rationales are overlapping but they're not identical. It's to show, in other words, that if you're a physics major at Congress College, women don't think, oftentimes they don't think they can do science and society doesn't expect them to do science. But if you graduate from a physics or a chemistry or biology from Congress College, aren't you showing that with respect to science majors, Women are just as capable as men. Yep. And that's clearly what Gilman had in mind. She created a fictional universe in which the first thing, of course, that intrigues these three guys is, man, no men there. They can't possibly. There must be men hiding, doing <laughs> all the real things in life. And part of what their disenchantment is, no, uh, enlightenment, let, let's call that. Although for Terry, it's disenchantment. A a as the book unfolds, remember, none of them can believe that, a, and by the way, it isn't just that, that it's Remember, these women are not living in thatch huts, and, and, and they're not, you know, walking on the ground with leather thongs and uh, on, on the places where they would get subsequently pinned in ceremonies. Um, uh, uh, the, remember, there is a science fiction quality to this, uh, and it isn't just the parthenogenesis. Remember, this is what these three guys are Americans from the 1880s and 90s, right? What kind of technology would they be used to? What's just coming into being in American life then? Huh? Can't hear you. No, not not in the not, uh, 1900. Oh, 1900. But that's what they had an airplane. Oh, that's right. So yeah, actually, like, that's uh, right. Uh, well, uh, 1903. Uh, the white white brothers, <laughs> right brothers. How's that for uh, uh, male uh, races? To, the white brothers, um, the right brothers. And by the way, so let's say 1910. 1915. They have airplanes, which means they clearly are also under automobiles, motors, electricity. But what's interesting is that Herland is a technologically advanced society. It's cleaner, it's nicer, the, the lives that the women lead are, are easier because technology has actually advanced more. So you understand, now you can say, well that's why women can do all these things. But no, I mean, the point that Gilman's trying to make is that, uh, uh, is that everything that Western society has produced with men and women together and excluding women, and do you remember the discussion we had last week about uh, uh, E equals MC squared, that great book by David Bodan? Yeah. That in fact, uh, probably, I, I'm going to take a guesstimate, one third of all the great discoveries and, and advancements in science have actually come from women who never got the credit. Now you see why Gilman had to write an all-female Utopia. Yeah. To show, and by the way, you could say, well, it's just it's just fiction. It doesn't show anything. But it does. It does in the sense that who's not prepared to believe that women can do anything that men can do? 
Amen. And therefore, you've got to sort of write a work. No, it's not just for men. Clearly, Gilman wanted to expand the imaginative potential of both men and women to get them to imagine. And I, I, I think <clears throat> I think Gilman would say with Aristotle that sometimes fiction is truer than history. It's actually the specific quote from the poetics is that tragedy is often truer than history. That because tragedy represents often in literature represents universal possibilities, whereas history is of a specific individual, right? But in this case, I think Gilman would say, getting men and women to imagine a world in which women can do anything isn't imagining something that can't exist. It's imagining something that should have existed. Mm -hmm. Now you see why it has to be single sex. Yeah. But uh, as you'll see, there are problems with this. Now, uh, um, <clears throat> so, so now do you see why? But when you say single sex, you are immediately confronted with uh, uh, the Amazon question. And, and Herodotus, who's the great uh, original great historian who actually argued there was there really was an Amazon society, how did the Amazons handle that problem? Reproduction. They just like capture. Yeah, they they, they they would capture men and, and have them be impregnated, and then the the, the male children they either kill or or send <coughs> out. Uh, in other words, they let men in for reproductive purposes, but then send them out. Her land is not Amazonia. It's it's. Um, but how is remember, and that's how has that happened? Um. Because of parthenogenesis. That, that's the other science fiction equality of this, right? Although, again, Herland does somewhat anticipate, as you'll see, as I've already suggested this last week, it, it <coughs> anticipates uh, uh, Firestone. At any rate, we'll come back to those because it's the erotic, it's the sexual dimensions which raised some of the interesting questions. Now let's turn to that in the second <coughs> question I want to ask her. Ask her. <clears throat> and that is, why let the men live? Why encourage them to marry? And I suggest there are two possible answers. Could you understand what would have been the Amazonian solution to Terry, Jeff, and Van Dyke landing there? Her. Kill them. And by the way, could the women do it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, that's the amazing thing is that these men think, oh, they're tough. But, but these women, soldiers, and not just the soldiers, women have no problem, obviously they've all learned Kung Fu, um, uh, but they have no trouble subduing them. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, Terry and, and Jeff and Van Dyke come to respect the physical prowess. By the way, I watched last night as I was doing some of these exam questions before I, I pretended to attend the faculty meeting today. One of the most beautiful films, I think, in the world in the last 20 years is Crouching Dragon, 